Hi, I'm Dr. Rena Malik, urologist and pelvic surgeon. Welcome back to my channel where you can learn everything you ever wanted to know about urology. So today I'm reacting to a new episode of Grey's Anatomy. This is the first episode where Katherine Avery, the female urologist, appears. She is amazing in this episode. I'm so excited to react to this for you guys. If you like what you see, make sure you give us a big thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out when I make new videos each and every Monday. We've all been postponed our surgery for grand rounds. This is a boring lecture. Your husband said it was mandatory. <laughs> One more hour of sleep, that's what it is. Oh no, it's not gonna be boring. This is Jackson's mother, Catherine Avery. She's a urologist, right? Yeah, I met her when I was an intern at Mercy West. She's amazing. For everybody, I know, I know, it's grand rounds where we have to sit and listen to somebody talk about how somebody did something and here's how they did it and there's not enough coffee in Brazil for this. <laughs> well, not today. Today we are going to do. Today I'm going to change a life and maybe make medical history too. And I can't do it alone, so who wants to step into the future with me? Woo! <laughs> okay, that's, that's all right, that's a start. Let's see if I can get a few more. Ryan, honey, would you come out here, please? Everybody, this is Ryan. Hi. Ryan, could you show everybody what we're here to do today? <laughs> that doesn't happen in Grand Rounds. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to invite a few very lucky residents to scrub in on this country's first penis transplant. Whoa. All right. So one, I love the way she walked out there with so much, just she captured the room and took control of the room. And that's exactly what you have to do when you're getting up and talking from such a large group. Uh, number two, this is not something that typically happens. People don't bring patients into grand rounds and have them disrobe in front of hundreds of people. That just doesn't happen. Uh, I have seen patients come in to talk to groups of people, but not in this sort of circumstance. But this does remind me of a urology story. So there was many years ago in the 1980s, a famous urologist who discovered what's called intercavernosal injections. And these are treatments for erectile dysfunction. And he came to a American urological meeting and he was describing this technique of intracravenosal injection where you inject your penis to get an erection and he, in order to display how this works, he had injected himself before the meeting and disrobed himself in front of hundreds of urologists, maybe thousands of urologists. And this was a account from another urologist who was attending. He said, all of a sudden I saw a gentleman with running shorts who went up to the podium to start his talk. He showed many slides of stages of penile erection from flaccid state to full erection. And to my surprise, he confirmed those were his own penis at different time points after stimulation. <laughs> and then when Jack Suset inquired if his erection was still present, he answered, I think so. And simultaneously, he opened his zipper and exposed his penis in full erection to the audience. By then, people were noticing that his sweatpants were bulging and whispers were rampant. He then paraded down the aisle asking people to feel it to make sure it wasn't a penile implant. So that's my urology story. I will link that story down below so you guys can read it if you so desire. Reconstructed organ that has been a little funky. Now, Mr. Bryant, a penis! 
<laughs> I really hope that my kids are never so mortified by me. Uh, but moving on to the penis transplant. So penis transplants have been done at this point in time. The first one was actually done in 2006 in China. And this was done after an episode of penile traumatic loss, but at about 14 days postoperatively had a real negative psychological response to having a transplanted penis and had it removed. So that was the very first one. After that, there was one done in South Africa in 2014. And that what occurred after a circumcision was done on a young man. I think he was about 18 when he had the circumcision and subsequently had a horrible complication where he lost a good part of his penis. So this is not something that normally happens. Apparently in South Africa, uh, there is this tradition where young men are given circumcisions as a transition to adulthood. And these are often done without sterile conditions. And so this these kind of sorts of horrible complications do happen in that part of the world. However, this is not common. In fact, I've never seen it or really heard of this happening after a circumcision. So that patient uh, subsequently did do well. After that, the first penile transplant in the United States was done in 2016 in Massachusetts uh, for a patient who had penile cancer. So I presume that that's where they kind of got the idea for this episode for because that patient had penile cancer and subsequently went on to get a penile transplant. And then subsequent to that, the first penile and scrotal transplant was done in Johns Hopkins. Currently, both the patients that were done in the U.S., we do have some follow-up data on and they both are having really good urinary stream and erections after the transplant. What Dr. Sloan, Mark Sloan brings up is that reconstructive surgery is typically what's being done at this time most commonly. We do use certain parts of the body to recreate a what's called a neophallus or a new penis. And to do that, sometimes we'll use a forearm flap or we'll use tissue that around the penis in the groin area, or sometimes we'll use thigh tissue. Dr. Avery, sorry to interrupt. Oh, interrupt, please. Oh, Mark Sloan, plastics the man who does. Listen, I'm all for standing up for the Johnson, but this is a transplant, and transplant patients reject organs. Now, I see a 28-year-old guy who could have a pretty good life with a reconstructed organ. So, Dr. Sloan brings up this point that transplants reject organs. So, transplant surgery is extremely risky, and so before anyone undergoes a transplant of any organ, you actually undergo a whole battery of tests, one to make sure what kind of donor you need. Certain things in your blood have to match up with an organ donor. You have to go through um, testing for infectious diseases, testing for regular kidney function and blood work. You have to go through testing that are specific to transplant antigens. You have to go through imaging. So for penis transplant, you actually need to go through a number of images to understand the nerves and the arteries that are going to the penis so that you can reconstruct them later on. And you also have to go through psychological testing to make sure that you are psychologically ready to get a transplant transplant because there is a mental component, right? You're getting an organ that used to belong to someone else that you visually see and use every single day. So it's a big psychological concern. So patients who are about to undergo this, a plastic surgeon, they'll meet a urologist, they'll meet a cardiologist. After you get a transplant, there is a risk of your body actually rejecting the transplanted organ. So typically patients are placed on what's called immunosuppressive medications. And these medications act to reduce the function of the immune system so your body doesn't attack this organ that's placed that's not your own. Surgery that you were probably going to see, uh, you have to reconnect the arteries and the veins and the nerves, which are really, really small structures. And typically you'll use a microscope to see those structures and to sew them together. It's very technical. It's very arduous and it does take 12 hours or even longer sometimes to do these very delicate surgeries. Who has worked with the tissue of the penis before? Kepner, keep your hand down. Shh. This <laughs> delicate vascularity demands a grace and elegance that not many surgeons of your station have mastered. The two surgeons to do the best end-to-end -end anastomosis of their chicken femoral vessels will scrub in with me. So be cautious, be careful, be brilliant, begin! This doesn't typically happen 
for where a bunch of residents are in a room practicing on chickens. But it is something that we do at home. We often find ways to practice. There are simulation labs in the hospitals to help you learn either robot or laparoscopic techniques. But for open techniques, sometimes you have to be creative. You'll often hear people suturing pig's feet or banana peels or things like that when they're learning how to suture. People were actually doing transplants on cadavers before they could do it on humans. And that's a great way to practice. If you have access to cadavers, which is often available in anatomy labs and things like that. Oh, and here he is, the man of the hour. Chad, honey, this is as far as you can go. Buddy, as soon as this is over, I'm going to take you to test drive that thing in every strip club. Hey, Chad, time. stop. <laughs> For the past year, all we've talked about is this. I miss talking about the Knicks. Tell me this is going to work so I can have my brother back. It's going to work. I'm going to go harvest Oregon right now. I'll see you in the OR. When this is over, you can never mention my penis again. Promise. <laughs> All right, buddy. You know, I feel for this guy because now he's going to wait for an entire day before he finds out how his brother is doing. So I think that being the family of a patient who is undergoing surgery is probably the hardest thing because I come out and talk to the family when they're all done and they really look at you and they make sure that you're smiling when you come out. They want to see no, like, no look of apprehension or fear or anything like that. And... So it's really, I can tell, and they're, they're just on edge. They're just waiting to hear the good news, uh, waiting to make sure that things went okay. And so I can imagine it can be extremely nerve wracking. And for something that's like 11, 12, 13, 14 hours, I mean, that's a long time to be waiting. So I often over tell patients how long they're gonna be in the OR because I don't want the family to be worried if you know a two hour surgery ends up taking three hours. There's lots of different factors that can extend the time of a surgery. You need an instrument that takes a little bit more time to get, or it it takes longer to put you to sleep or wake you up. So there's a lot of different factors that go into it. But for all of you who've had to wait for family going through surgery, I totally feel you and I will do my best. And all of us surgeons do do our best to make sure that we keep you at ease and keep you updated throughout surgery. Thank you so much for letting me help you with this. I mean, how often do you get to harvest a penis? Well, I thought it would give us a chance to catch up. Take this, dear. Okay, here we go. Like millions of angry wives have dreamed of. <laughs> Except we'll start with an artistic, elliptical incision. Oh, how's it going, honey? Well, you know, it's fifth year, and chief president is like 20 jobs in one. On top of that, I got boards coming up and surgeries to log. So much to get done. Mm. So when are you going to have sex with a man? When are you going to get that done? <laughs> hmm? That's bold. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, what? I don't know, or hear why you're waiting, dear. But unless you have a good reason, I say do it. You're all wound up. It'll get you unwound. It'll make you a better surgeon. Oh, that's a nice dorsal vein. Yeah, easy to grab. <laughs> Is it really that obvious? You keep looking at this thing like it's going to bite you. <laughs> I, well, That is not typical OR talk. We don't encourage our assistants to go have sex. That's not appropriate, <laughs> but very comical. Dr. Avery, thank you so much for bringing me in. This is so exciting. Oh, honey, relax, honey, relax. Suction, please. Lightly, lightly. And that, ladies and gentlemen, completes the work on this dorsal artery. Everybody, stretch, shake out your hands, take a breather. Your technique has improved, baby. Thanks. It's easy to teach when there's natural ability to work with. Your boy's born for plastics. That might be so. But you know, you got to be careful with that easy road. A person can get used to taking the easy road, and next thing they know, they find themselves the boob job king of Seattle, a tummy tuck tycoon. I don't think that's fair. More irrigation and suction. Are you saying there isn't easy money in plastics, Dr. Sloan? Are you saying there's no valuable work to be done She's there? saying I don't have the discipline to resist easy money. I'm just saying there's a temptation. 
gently, April. Yeah, well, maybe if you knew a little more about me, you'd know that I'm incredibly disciplined. And I'm not a tummy tuck tycoon. I'm sorry about that, Dr. Sloan. Don't she's obviously apologize true. for me. Yeah, well, somebody Such needs an to. Such an April, right way here, the dorsal vein. I chose plastics. Here? I pursued Dr. Sloan. These are my choices. I'm not going to sit here and let you trash them because they're not the same choices you would have made. Back off. You back off. Not you, the suction. April. Oh, God, the vein is stuck. Oh, what, what, what do I do? All right, shut up the suction Don't now. move, it's spreading. She's mangling oh, it. Oh, my God, it's not stopping. Oh, oh, oh no. Oh, God. What did I do? You destroyed my dorsal vein. It's very hard to suction an entire vein like that. I would be very surprised if that happened in real life. Also, having these types of serious conversations does not bode well for when you're actually doing a very serious surgery like this. Again, probably would not be fighting with your mother in the OR. Take all the time you need. It's like Christmas freaking morning, dude. <laughs> I will shut up. Okay. I'm ready. There's quite a bit of swelling, but that will go down. And it'll do everything it's supposed to. <sighs> it's great. Thank you. You want to see? I'll give you one last look. I'm good, bro. I'm happy if you're happy. This was a really great episode. I really love Katherine Avery. She is a fantastic character to play a female urologist. I genuinely believe that female urologists are few but mighty. I have linked down below a great review in the scientific literature about penile transplants, as well as the paper from the first United States penile transplant, so you can take a look at those if you like. And thank you so much for watching. I appreciate all the support from our YouTube community. Please let me know what else you want to see down below and always remember to take care of yourself because you're worth it.